This call is from Scott. This call will be recorded and subject to monitoring at any time. To accept this call, press 5. To block this call, you may begin speaking now. Welcome back to Bizarre Bazaar. And in this episode, we have part two of my interview with serial killer Scott Kimball. Scott is convicted of killing four people, but the FBI strongly suspect him in the murder of another 23. If you want more backstory on Kimball's crimes, then make sure you check out part one of my interview. The link is in the description. Most of Kimball's early life is undocumented and this is what we will be covering in this episode. I asked him questions and also just let him talk, as the point of this interview is to understand how someone can become a serial killer. He says he was born that way, but I'm not so sure. There will be more parts to this interview, so please drop the video a like and subscribe if you're new so you don't miss future episodes. Before we start, if you want to write to inmates like I do, then use the service I use. It's called Jmail. It's fast and it's secure, and it means you don't have to use your home address. That's the main reason why I like it. You get physical letters sent to your house, but you don't give the inmates your home address. I'll leave a link to their services in the description below. Just go check out the website. I think it's best to start with your family. And what was your relationship like with them uh, when you were growing up? Well, um, I don't want to really, really, uh, I'll talk to you about that, but I don't want to um, really blame my family for anything because I don't, I don't think that they failed me. I think I just did what I did. But um, my mom and dad divorced when I was about 10. And um, so there was kind of a split custody type deal. I would spend time with my mom and time with my dad back and forth. And, and um, I kind of thought that was a, kind of a good thing in a way because I got two birthday parties every year, I got two Christmases every year, I got to go on two vacations every year, and so, um, you know, it was kind of... This call is from a federal prison. I looked for the good and everything instead of looking the bad that mom and dad are split up. I looked for it as, um, well, you know, I go to two houses, I have two bedrooms, I, you know, what I can, I know what I can get away with this parent, I know what I can't get away with that, with that parent, and I was always pushing the limits. So, in your own words, you'd say you had a pretty decent upbringing? Oh, absolutely. I was taught right, right from wrong. I was taught to say please and thank you. I was taught to address adult with yes sir, yes ma'am. Um, yeah. They made sure that I had an education. They made sure that I had uh, nutritious food. They made sure that I had um, proper clothing and they made sure I was in activities and, and I participated in in school sports and they I had a, absolutely a a good upbringing. Now, my dad was really, um, he was a disciplinarian. He took no nonsense. Uh, he was never, uh, what I would say, abusive. Um, now, today's standards might be considered different, but back then it was a little different. You know, you could knock your kid around a little bit, never punch him or anything, but you could whip him. But uh, my dad was just always um, told you something. He wanted you to just say, yes, sir, I understand. And if you had any questions, he wanted to be sure that you asked questions, because if you tell him you understood, you better not do it twice because he explained it to you and he'd always say, uh, uh, do you understand? I'd say yes. He said, don't tell me you understand. Just to shut me up. I want to go doing this again. Tell me you understand because you really get what I'm telling you. My mom, she was a little bit uh, more lenient because she felt my dad was a little too hard on us kids. But um, looking back now, I think my dad was, was you know, uh, really as hard as he felt he needed to be and he could have maybe been a little harder, but who knows. Are you still in touch with any of your family today? Um, some of them I am. My mom, my mother has passed, and um, I'm not in contact with my dad, but some of my family I'm, I'm in contact with. Uh, with my dad is the situation with, um, with what we'll get to in eventually one of my crimes where I ended up shooting his brother, so I think that's part of it right there. Yeah, um, your uncle's something we definitely need to speak about later. Uh, but I was wondering if I can clear something up as well. Uh, in the comments, people always say, like, uh, serial killers and, you know, people who do bad things and only like dropped on the head as a child or they've got some like head trauma or, you know, head abuse, concussions. Um, can you vouch for any of this? Is this true? Um, it wasn't abuse like that, but uh, as a kid, 
we uh, I played a lot of sports, and we didn't have the protective helmets like um, they had they have now. You know, we didn't have uh, in football. We didn't have proper fitting helmets, and we you know we just grabbed a helmet that fit close as we could. And some of our practices were really extreme. I remember as 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 a young boy, um, you know, having co- several concussions. I remember one time um, falling off a, a haystack and landing on my head, and you know. Uh, one time I was hit by a baseball in the head. So, I mean, there were several instances as a young boy that I uh, had had injuries. And um, uh, so, you know, I, I, I do I do acknowledge those type of things. Uh, when I was 16, I was in a car wreck, and I was sitting in the passenger uh, seat, and we were broadsided by another vehicle. And, of course, I wasn't wearing a seatbelt. We didn't have seatbelt laws back then. And so I took a, a really good um, good blow to the head that way was knocked unconscious and, and taken to the hospital and later just uh, told him I want to go home and you can't keep me and that was it. So I've had, I've had several 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 head injuries as a, as a youth. So maybe there is something more to it then? They say there is, that's what the experts say but I'm definitely not an expert and I'm not making any excuses. Okay, you were young when you first went to prison and um, I'm just wondering what was that like and what happened? I was still in high school the very first, actually, the very first time I went to jail, um, I was 10, 10 years old, and we were at the high school throwing a football around, just being kids, a bunch of us kids, and we had actually broke into the concession stand that sold refreshments at the uh, football field for football games and different events, and we broke in stole the candy bars, we stole the money, and we, we cooked hot dogs and, and drank. This call is from a federal prison. And we just kind of ran amok of the place and uh, really kind of enjoyed the way it felt to break into the yeah, concession stand and it felt good to eat all that candy and had all the candy and pass it around to some of the kids and that it was us. They took us to jail and handcuffed us and tried to scare us and remember them tell me all kinds of things they were going to do to to me and I told them that I wasn't an idiot that you were a cop you can't do that to kids so they kind of took their whole scare tactic and threw it out the window because um, this 10 year old kid wasn't going to fall for their bullshit it sounds to me like you were very intelligent at that age and also had like a sense of fearlessness uh, are these characteristics that you carry with you? Um, yeah, I, um, I, uh, I, I'm not, not one to, like, I don't want to be the one that, I don't toot my own horn, or I'm not that way. I'm very, mm-hmm. very um, humble, but I've had uh, many people test my IQ, and uh, I've had uh, one IQ test tell me I was uh, uh, scored at 143, and I had another one tell me I was... 147 and so I'm, I'm right there in in the 140s but I don't um, I don't ex- I, I don't ex- excel in like um, never applied myself in school school to me was uh, to be having fun yeah listen to a bunch of a bunch of teachers trying to tell you how to live your life I went to school to get away from the ranch and I went to school to uh, be with my friends and have have fun. And what other kind of crimes were you doing um, when you were a kid? When I was a kid, I would steal things from, I would steal guns out of pickup trucks, and I would steal cameras out of pickup trucks. Uh, when people were were at work, I would go into their homes and uh, steal their money. I would siphon gas out of vehicles. I just did, um, did kind of whatever I wanted to do. I just always felt like they they would have to catch me, and if I didn't squeal on myself, and I didn't tell the wrong person, I wouldn't have to worry about it. And where were your family during all of this? I know, like, most people's families, if their child was doing stuff like this, they would be around them and support them. Where were yours? Well, there's no way that a family can, uh, can do something about it if they don't know what's happening. Okay, so the schools and everyone were just totally unaware and you managed to just go under the radar? Yeah, I would be at school and I would write a fake note to the teacher and 
a scribble of my mom or dad's dad's name to it, saying that I was going to be gone for this this many hours, and I would uh, do what I wanted to do. Okay, you said um, by the time you were 16, your crimes had started to progress. I'm just wondering what happened, and can you tell us what they were? Well, by the time I was 16, I had a vehicle, and I had had uh, access to the to the roadways and access to different parts of the county and different parts of the area, and so I could drive to other cities and in other towns, and I could um, just kind of um, find to the other people. They wouldn't notice me, they wouldn't see me, and so I just started committing more crimes. I would uh, do typical things that, like an adult would do. And what kind of crimes were they, and how did you learn to do them? Well, I learned just by paying attention and watching. I learned by listening to people that uh, would tell me how they got caught. And I figured, well, that's a mistake. I can't, definitely can't do that. I just would would um, think, I would think things through. I wouldn't just, very rarely did I just uh, act in a spur of the moment type of way. I'm, I'm not saying that never happened, but sometimes that would happen. And what kind of crimes were you committing? I was doing a little bit of everything. I was uh, doing insurance scams. I was uh, committing robberies. I was committing thefts. I was writing bad checks. I think the biggest scam I did when I was uh, 16 was I burned down a bar and restaurant for my girlfriend's dad. And uh, after I got away with that, I had a bunch of cash in my pocket. Uh, He let me come into the bar and drink. And I just kind of felt like I was bulletproof. Can you tell us a little bit more about this job? Like, set the scene a little bit for us. Yeah, I was uh, I was in high school, and I was kind of known to be a, a wild kid and living on the wild side and, you know, kind of really pushing the boundaries of, of uh, right and wrong. And um, I knew that her dad was, a, was um, a local bar and restaurant owner, and I knew that he had a reputation for, for serving, uh, you know, underage high school kids. And he was kind of like the cool guy, and, you know, he'd... he'd uh, let his daughter sneak beer out the back of the bar and we all drink and some uh, he'd hire us kids to go in there and clean the bar after they close at two in the morning and we have have wild parties in there and then one day he had he had uh, approached approached us about how he was about to lose the business because he had uh, owed a bunch of money on it in the the land and the bar and the location was worth worth so much more than what he owed but he couldn't come up with the cash and so he'd approached me one night drink, and he's like, yeah, I just wish I had uh, some brave little fucker to come in here and burn the place down, and uh, it'd be re- re- really be worth his worth his time, and he'd have a pocket full of cash and a friend for life, and so after a couple of days, he'd mentioned it again to me, and I told him, I said, hell, I'll do it, and so he looked at me, really, and uh, I told him, yeah, and so he had this plan all laid out. He'd already had all planned, and he needed an alibi, and you know, him and all his family needed to be, be uh, somewhere that everybody had seen him, and to make sure that it was, uh, you know, there was no suspicions on him, and he had told me exactly what he thought the best way was, and he told me where a great place to park my vehicle is, and I could hike through this this uh, field and cross a little forest, you know, of trees, and go right in towards the back. And he said nobody would ever see you, and uh, so he just gave me a, a decent chunk of money at the time, and told me as soon as he got the insurance settlement, he would uh, be sure and reimburse me. And then when they rebuilt the bar. You know, just the whole thing is, we'll really look out for you, and you'll never have to buy buy a dinner here, and you'll never have to pay for a drink, and you know. So I just thought that was a, a pretty good opportunity, mm-hmm. and uh, I was always always uh, brave enough to to do stupid shit that I shouldn't have did. But you know, when you're when you're young and, and uh, you really don't think about the long term consequences or what what arson leads to the next crime, and the next crime leads to the next crime, and so that's uh, pretty much what happened there. It was a big deal, and you know, I suspect that it was faulty wiring, and you know, they did an investigation. And it didn't look like arson, and of course, him and his family and everybody were, uh, you know, miles away, and they were at uh, some banquet dinner, and you know, it was, so it was just a big, big deal, and it was a major story and event that had happened in in, in my hometown. So, how did you feel when you were doing it? Um, I felt that um, I felt good because I felt that this man, this older guy who had owned a bar and uh, was letting me date his daughter, who had put enough trust in me, and I realized that he was kind of uh, in a bad spot 
that uh, he was going to lose what him and his family had worked hard to save because he made some bad decisions. He was a gambler. And um, I thought it was good that he, he trusted me to do that. And I really liked the uh, thought that he was going to fill my pockets full of cash. And I had already thought in my mind of all the things I could buy, like a, a new compound bow and a rifle and a new stereo system and, you know, new clothes and all kinds of different things. You know, new new hunting equipment, new fishing equipment. And I had already thinking I'm going to have the best stuff anybody my age has. I was I was wanted the best. I was had the had to have the have the nicest things. And so instead of just earning them and saving my money the proper way, I took a risky ways and um, really stepped out on a limb and, and had done you know some pretty good crimes. And I always thought, well, I'm a kid. They can't uh, you know they can't. What can they do to me? You know, slap me on the wrist, uh, make me go stay in the jail on the weekends. I just thought that there's really no punishment that could ever stop me. And that was pretty accurate. And we'll get into that later because I kept going to court and the judge would give me a slap on the wrist and tell me don't come back. And I keep going to the court and the judge would slap me on the wrist and tell me don't come back. And it got over and over and over. I was in court like once a year and I'd spend 30 days in jail or 20 days in jail or 10 days in jail. And after about 15 years of in and out of court and being on probation, the judge finally let that hammer down on, down on me, hammered the boom to me, and I still kind of beat their system, and that really pissed the judge off. But we can get down to that when we're, you know further down down the episodes if if uh, if you want to stay in order. But that's really kind of a, a way that showed that the justice really tried to give as many chances as they could to to a, a to a young white guy. Do you feel if you were punished properly sooner? Uh, things might have turned out differently for you. Uh, that's 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 uh, that's a possibility, but it doesn't always work that way. And um, you know what they say, hindsight is twenty twenty. And so, you know, that's how the system is designed. But the system doesn't work that way. Every time they let me go, um, of course, of course, I knew there was always prison hanging over my head. But you know, I would never worry about it or start to start to get a sweat on my forehead until I'm right there listening to the judge's decision. And then um, I'd get out of court after I was real humble and tell the judge, thank you, Your Honor, thank you, Your Honor. And I'd get out of the, out of the court, out of sight, kind of fist pump, and I'd be like, I knew it. You know, and so, but I did know that every time I saw him, he was starting to get a little bit more impatient with me and a little bit more tried. And um, so I knew that every next time I was kind of walking on a little thinner layer of ice, I was kind of getting out to the edge a little bit, and then finally the ice did break off. This interview is still ongoing, so if you've got any questions for Kimball, or you've spotted something you want to point out, please let me know in the comments. That's all we've got time for in this episode. Until next time, stay sane.